why do you invest in annuities, man? Come on, give me a break, man. <laughs> it is literally, it is the equivalent of buying life insurance. It is the worst <laughs> possible decision you can make in a low interest environment, especially on top of Four percent, four percent, just clicking along every day. Boom, boom, boom. Welcome to the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I'm Sam Marks. And I'm Johnny FD. We're self-made entrepreneurs who invest our own money and use modern technology to invest like a boss. Join us each week for exclusive interviews with our network of modern investors, business owners, and multimillionaires to discover new ways to invest our hard-earned cash. Hey, bosses. This is Johnny, and welcome to episode 125 of the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I am in Tbilisi, Georgia. Where are you, Sam? Tampa. Oh. (laughs) Jeff. Jealous. Yeah, you should be. Jealous. Are you drinking Georgian wine? It looks like it. I just saw something there. Uh huh. In a oh my gosh, liter plastic bottle. It looks like Johnny is drinking gasoline. It actually looks like it's a gasoline bottle in like a third world country when you see them on the side of the road. (laughs) What is that? It's basically homemade wine. And if you oh wow, can you see the uh, viscosity of this? Like how thick it is, Johnny. I'm very impressed with your vocabulary. That's a big word. Uh, And yes, I can. I I only know that from motor oil, actually. (laughs) Stuff looks disgusting. (laughs) I I mean, it looks really nasty. So the the reason why it's so thick is so little brief wine history before we get get started with the episode. Georgia is the oldest producing wine country in the world, and they basically in i don't know if they invented wine but they're they're the oldest like producing country still and they do wow. it this really old fashioned way where they didn't bother taking away like the leaves and the sticks from the grape branches they just threw the whole thing into ferment all right and it gives it this like a really like thick uh, like consistency that you don't get with normal grapes where you crush it first you get rid of the skins you get rid of the seeds you kind of get rid of everything and you just have like the juice in yeah. georgia it's like you get the real deal so it's basically like unfiltered beer but yeah wine. wow that's interesting because i know uh, i've gone to a few v- wineries and seen how it's made and i know with like the high premium ones they'll actually take out the seeds Mm-hmm. And just put, you know, and it's like a pretty delicate process. Mm-hmm. But then with a the high volume commercial wines that you see, like, you know, Yellowtail, usually they'll just crush the entire grape with the seeds, but that's mm-hmm. supposed to produce a little bit of a less quality wine. Yeah. And then it sounds like in Georgia, they just, they just do the whole, <laughs> just pick the whole bush and throw it in. Yeah. It's pretty cool. And do you know why people crushed grapes with their feet and not with like a stone or a machine? Uh, I want to say it has something to do with the oils or or uh, oh, the close. delicacy of the yeah, foot. Yeah, close, close. Yeah. Well, so basically, yeah, you're you're right about that. When you use like a machine or a rock or something, yeah, it crushes the it crushes the the juice out, but it also breaks the seed, and inside the seed is bitter. Mm. But your feet, it'll crush the the you know the skin and the and the meat, so you get the juice, but it won't it won't break the it won't break the 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 seal of the seeds. So you get like a uh, nicer wine. Well, it makes sense that Georgia is the oldest wine producing country because in that region, you always you always hear about early civilization, Greek civilization. Uh, Greece isn't exactly next to Georgia, but it's it's not too far off. Uh, and you always hear about the old kings and everybody just drinking wine out of those, what do they call it, goblets. Uh, and it sounded like a lot of fun back in the day. Yeah, well, they would actually drink them out of horns, like almost like a Viking horn. Mm-hmm. And the reason mm-hmm. is... S- s- Actually, well, I guess another trivia. Why do they drink out of a horn instead of out of a, out of a, a cup? Uh, I know this one. Uh, I know this one. God's killing me. Oh, I do know that I've heard wine this Wine connoisseur Sam Marks. I'm very disappointed. I don't even drink that much I've wine. I've been drinking out of horns lately. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think anyone has since like, what, 1600s. But they, they did it so you'd have to finish a drink before putting it down. That is not the answer I was thinking of, but it <laughs> <laughs> makes sense. It was kind of just to like, You're, you know, make sure everyone like into your pants. Yeah. Like everyone got drunk and everyone just enjoyed themselves. Great. Well, I'm glad you made it to Georgia safe. Uh, you're officially the first person that I've talked to that's actually been to Georgia. So I'm looking forward to hearing more and um, get out there and explore and share some gems with us. Man, I wish you can come out here. It's it's so far, it's it's cool. I, I have to stay longer to really get to know it, but even just the visa is so easy. Y- you arrive and we get one year on arrival. Mm. 
Just like you, well, you, you, you walk in, they stamp your passport and say, okay, don't stay for more than a year at a time. But if you want to go out and come right back, you get another year. It's pretty incredible. It's a good, good destination. Well, I'm telling you, you're really missing out here in Tampa, Johnny. Oh, yeah? You're just missing out. <laughs> what am I, Summer tell me Tampa what I'm missing out on. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have actually enjoyed really being back as much as I dog it here. Uh, summertime, thunderstorms every single day. But after the last two months of being abroad in Europe and then over to California and now here, it's just been so nice to buckle down in a routine, get my dual monitors up. Just, you know, I was working the whole time over in Europe, but it just feels like I'm crushing a lot of stuff and being highly productive and I'm doing yoga every day. It just, you got to have all that stuff in balance. For me, yeah. I, have to, I have to stay in balance. Yeah, I, I definitely agree having a home base is nice. But fortunately, mm -hmm. I have a huge three bedroom Airbnb here. Super nice. Like, super like luxury, like living room, chandeliers. I have, I probably have like 20 wine glasses. So if anyone wants to come over to drink some of my plastic bottle homemade wine, you guys are welcome to. I'll be interested if you have, if we have any listeners in Georgia. Yeah, let probably. me know. Yeah, yeah, let me know. So the coolest thing about being here is my rent on Airbnb was 420 bucks an entire month. It's not bad. It's yeah. not bad, but it's certainly not the cheapest you've ever had. But either. this, this is a three bedroom place. So it's, it's, True. it's nice. But what's nice is, invest like possibly investing i don't know if i would want to invest here in georgia because i don't know enough about their political or you know real estate situation here but one thing that both you and i have been wanting to get more and more into is real estate investing mm -hmm. so i'm really glad that we're gonna have omar khan back on the show he was actually if a guest on a previous episode, if you guys remember, it was Invest Like a Boss episode 105, and it's called Cap Rates, Understanding Real Estate Yields and Valuations. And we're going to have him back on today to talk about something called PPM <laughs> materials. What is that, Sam? I, uh, You know, it's a private placement memorandum. Um, I first heard about this right out of college in a startup. And then I didn't really hear about them since. And I know we'll talk about this in the episode. But basically, a, a private placement memorandum is 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 for private investments. Uh, and they seem to be most largely used in real estate investing and some of these real estate funds that we've been going into. I think they're also commonly used in startups and other types of private investing, but maybe just not quite as regular. But I've been seeing them pop up uh, in almost all these different real estate deals that we've been investing in and I don't really know how to navigate it. It's a lot of wordy stuff and I know we'll get into it on this episode, uh, but I also wanna pick Omar's brain about some of the tax advantages for wealthy people. Uh, at the th what's, what's it, 1031 exchange? exchange? Yeah. I'm getting a, I'm getting like internet terms with 301 redirect <laughs> <laughs> confused with 1031 exchange, uh, but we keep hearing about how wealthy people and and high income earners are leveraging some of the property advantage uh, tax advantages to really bring down their tax brackets and i feel like there's some secrets that we're still missing or just some public information that we are not as attuned to and i want to pick omar's brain on it a very very popular episode back on cap rates as you said episode 105 encourage anyone who hasn't heard that to listen to it very uh, very important information just about valuing properties, how to value properties, uh, and, and just like liquidity around properties. So I'm excited to dive back into it. We're going to focus a little bit on the important parts of what's in a PPM and what you need to know, how much time you need to put into it, how to do proper due diligence, but don't let that bore you. I promise this will be an exciting episode. Yeah. And if you guys still aren't really sure how this is going to affect you, basically a PPM is not the contract necessarily, but like the terms. Kind of like when you want to invest in, into a deal, they send you a PDF or something and it says, these are the terms of the deal. And most of us, I'm sure Sam never reads it, but this is how you actually read it, what it all means and why, you know, we should look it over before we wire someone 50 grand. <laughs> so let's have Omar on so he can explain to us uh, all about the, the tax advantages, the, the 1031 exchange, uh, other ways to save money and, and why like rich people, especially in the US, invest in real estate more than almost anything else. 
and also how to read these materials and what's what's important. So I'm excited. Omar, welcome to the show. Everyone, welcome back. Got a great guest on again. Not very often we bring on guests twice, but in the case of Mr. Omar Khan, we had to do it. Omar, welcome back to the show. Well, I feel uh, thank you. First of all, it's a great honor to be back with the, with the boss himself. <laughs> well, you know, you send out so much good content, Omar. It's hard to turn away from it. It really is. And I've, I've given you a couple shout outs since we've had you on last. The material you put out, very informative, easy to read, which is as important as anything, uh, especially for our listeners and myself, as we're going to get into PPM materials on here. Not necessarily easy to read, but you do a great job of making the stuff digestible for everybody. So thank you for uh, your, your continuous work in the field and helping us understand the stuff better. No worries. And uh, I think like I told you earlier in one of our conversations, if you're ever having difficulties going to sleep at night, you should read the P- you should read any any PPM you can get your hands on. You will go to sleep in less than five minutes. That's fantastic news because about a year ago, I was yeah. battling insomnia and I couldn't sleep for months. Uh, and I've actually never tried reading a PPM. So yeah. this <laughs> even... I mean, look, even... <laughs> I'm not saying you like me for it, though. You might hate me for it, but you, at least you'll go to sleep. Couldn't you just put some like funny one-liners in there in, in, the, in the material just to, so it like, kind of keeps you edgy? Be like, oh... I got that little, like a little inside joke, a little innuendo of some sort. (laughs) Well, you can. Uh, I'm going to be, I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say you can, but do you want to work with somebody who's throwing in funny one-liners in their legal (laughs) office? Probably want to stay away from that guy for obvious reasons. Yeah. Well, you know, the first time I ever heard the word PPM, I was 22, I was just out of college and I was starting to work for this, uh, this venture back startup and they brought me in to all the legal meetings and we're doing these quote unquote PPM materials, which I'd never heard of. And, you know, I thought that just became, that was a standard in any type of private offering because that's what they're putting it together for. But since that day, uh, more than 10 years ago, I'd never heard of the term PPM before, or sorry, again, since outside of most recently when I've been doing, you know, just started doing private real estate investing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and I, so I, I guess just to start, is it like it in that case, it was used for startup tech investing, yeah. but it seems like it's much more commonly used for real estate deals. Well, yeah, you would think that because a lot of just generally, you know, a lot of folks are more like, let's put it this way, more folks know about real estate then they'll know particularly or they'll get an opportunity to invest in tech investments. So you tend to, one would tend to assume that it's more common in real estate. But to be honest with you, a private placement memorandum quite literally is what it says in the name. So let's assume you and I want to open up a restaurant, right? Mm -hmm. And whatever, franchise, whatever we want. And we want to go raise money privately from multiple people. And we want to do it the right, you know, this legal route. This is a particular route we've chosen. So we can issue you, we can issue a PPM. We might be one of the very few people in the country issuing a PPM, but it's any private placement of funds, which is governed by a particular court structure and all of that. That's a PPM. Now you can apply it in real estate, tech, you name it. Hmm. Well, I've jo- like I have a startup, and we never did uh-huh. PPM. We did subscription agreements. Oh yeah. Uh, but yeah. we didn't do necessarily a PPM. Would PPM be kind of a second level? on top of that yeah typically it is it's an extra layer on top of that and not Mm -hmm. to like bore you to death basically ppm is basically because essentially there's certain laws and rules governing this right so the more quote-unquote restrictive you want to get the more essentially the more paperwork you're going to get right so you have a subscription subscriber agreement an operating agreement is between partners i hope you guys did that because otherwise you're going to hate your partners in five years from now oh or or today or today, uh, yeah, you could, I didn't want to go there, Sam, but you know, you went there, right? And then the PPM is just basically governs it because this is somewhat. I would, I don't want to use the word standardized, but it covers some of the standardized uh, offerings, uh, standardized terms of the offerings, mm-hmm. and then these are basically filed to ensure that there's just a higher level of compliance, then, right? Because, for instance, uh, whereas you can make a PPM very exotic you still have to be within some perimeters. Now, when you put together a PPM, is it automatically registered or visible to say the SEC? Because I know there are some clauses in this regarding the SEC, or is that no, just I have for- to file, No, I have to file it with the SEC, okay. eventually, right? So what happens is we'll, we'll have the people sign the PPM, the OA, the SA, all of that. Sign. Well, not really the OA, the SA mostly. And then our lawyer will then basically, 
again, not to bore you, what will happen is we'll see, okay, which of the states, for instance, are our investors coming in from, right? Because we have to file this in that particular state's uh, Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, so yeah, so that's basically what it does. So we have to file it eventually with the regulatory authorities. Okay. Well, I mean, talking about boring, yeah, this is really boring. Jeez. <laughs> oh, it's, it's it's not even fair. You know, John, I'm in Lithuania. I'm in uh, Vilnius right now, the capital. And Johnny just flew over from Ukraine and he's hanging out here for a week. And as per typical, he's outside all day playing on scooters, messing around, going on walking <laughs> tours. And I'm inside doing all the work. There's a narrative here. Absolutely. <laughs> it's 745 at night, my time. I'm recording podcasts on PPM, although I have a great guest and an excellent company in Omar. Johnny's oh, out riding you. electric scooters. It's a bunch of BS. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Sam. It makes me feel really nice the way you said it. <laughs> well, you know, this can't be the most fun part of your job. I'm sure you enjoy being out on properties, doing deals, slapping hands and making money for investors. This is, but this is, of course, a formality, right? Like, oh, yeah. you know, how, how much of an effort is it for you every time you have to put together this for a deal? Or is it basically boilerplate for you at this point? Well, look, again, it's semi-boilerplate and not semi-boilerplate. It's still pulling teeth a lot of times because it's legal work. And when you're dealing with lawyers, it's literally pulling teeth all the time. Because we have a particular like you know structure in place. We've got a particular terms in place now. So for us, it's kind of a plug and play thing. But just to emphasize the point, there are no standard PPMs. Right. Because mm -hmm. even though you might have the same headers uh, or a table of contents, what I tell people is look, you still want to read the big highlighted areas because, look, it's your money at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So what you don't want to do is people hide behind a bunch of legalese. And then six months from now, you figure out, oh, that 10 percent I was promised really starts in year three. And I didn't read page 145 subsection B. Right. Mm -hmm. So basically, whereas the table of contents is the same for us, it's somewhat of a plug and play. But again, because it's your hard earned money, what I tell people is, look, at least the salient read the salient sections. Right. To at least get an idea. But look, uh, Sam, to, at the end of the day, with private placements, a big component of this is basically the relationship you have with the sponsor. Mm -hmm. Right. So at the end of the day, you kind of have to vet the sponsor more than anything else. Right. And I know it's becoming very you know, it's it's becoming very fashionable, you know, to go on like say a cadre or a crowd three and whatever and it's kind of opening up the private asset space to a lot of investors where you can just sit on your computer and do this. The problem is, man, that every few years we kind of go through some uh, an evolution of this model and every few years people get hurt really mm -hmm. badly because there is a reason why there's so many stipulations in place. Because every 10 years we find out that somebody's taken advantage of private people because they didn't properly understand it or some version of that. And that's why there's so many stipulations in place. And that's why there's so many legal work. Because when you look, for instance, when you're a public company and you got a stock offerings and all of that, there is such a high level of disclosure on you mm -hmm. that you really, and compliance, that you really can't, I mean, you can, but you really can't hide a lot of things, right? But with private investments, what happens is, for instance, your sponsor can never show you the financial statements and you, ca and you have no recourse, hmm. right? So these are things that you need to know up front as opposed to later on in the process. Right. So what, like, what's an example of, uh, like, I, I, I guess I'm just new to this, uh -huh. this world, especially of crowdfunding and yeah. these platforms that enable people like myself to get into these deals. I mean, I've only been looking at this stuff for about two or two and a half years, but okay. so far I have not heard of too many people getting burned or hurt, at least not on a large, like public level. Like, yeah, I know the, the reason for that is the market's only going up, right? So everybody right. looks like a genius when the market's, dude, everybody thinks they're the next Sam Zell when the market's going up, right? Who's Sam, who's Sam Zell? Sam Zell is one of the most legendary uh, real estate investors of our time. He's also a really cranky old man, which is why I like him. <laughs> right. I so everybody thinks, they're, everybody thinks they're a genius, right? Because in a bull market, everybody confuses uh, luck with brains, actually. Yeah, right. Which is why this stuff is important, right? Because yeah. I was just going to ask you, I I've never looked at any of the these documents for better or for worse. I've always just kind of yeah. gone with the crowd, you know, placed a bet on the sponsor and the relationship with the sponsor, even startup investing. I've, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in, you know, pretty heavily into a bunch of startups. I've never yeah, looked at a subscription see, agreement or anything. See, but with startups also, to be honest with you, that's more of an intangible sort of thing, right? Where it mm -hmm. quite literally is... It's a brain power issue, right? Like, how do you value brain power, 
or an yeah. idea, right? So it's a little more intangible, but with more tangible assets like say real estate, or I guess if you're investing in say a restaurant or a mine or some version of that, there's a tangible asset there. So mm. there is there is some level of valuation, which is a lot more easier than valuing an idea that is just starting out. Right. Right. So that's why with more real assets, again, at the end of the day, you're hundred percent right. Look, you're backing the jockey, not the horse. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're backing the sponsor. And at the end of the day, look, we all know that honest people don't need the law to tell them they're honest. Right. And to do mm -hmm. the right thing. And dishonest people also don't need the law to tell them to be dishonest. Right. 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 But what you need to do is because it's your hard earned money. What I tell people is, look, in a summary, what you need to do is just understand the incentive mechanism, which is basically the distribution of cash flows. Right. Man, you get that. You've got 99 percent of your work done. Mm -hmm. And that's quite literally one or two sections, which is less than one or two pages. Right. And if you don't understand that clearly and it's not written in clean language, like literally like a five year old should be able to understand this. Right. This has either one of two meanings. Either the lawyer is awful who's written this. Right. And they're incompetent, which, by the way, is no excuse. Right. Or this person's trying to hide something from you. They're really it's I'm telling you, it, it is that stark. Because if you cannot understand the distribution of cash flows, reading it once or twice, maybe three times, right, in very plain, simple English, right? Mm -hmm. And for instance, if you have a question and you ask this from a sponsor, which I highly encourage people to do, because again, it's your hard-earned money, right? And a sponsor cannot answer it to you in a couple of like lines with very clean, simple English. You do not need to use anything above a fifth grade level of English, mm -hmm. right? Either the sponsor doesn't know what's going on, or the sponsor is unscrupulous. And in both those situations, you need to head the head towards, you need to run towards the hills and away from this person. Now, is the distribution of cash flow an actual clause in the PPM? Yeah. Is it, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's yeah. the title, distribution of cash flow? So, okay, it could be titled whatever way you want it to be titled, mm -hmm. number one, right? Again, with these legal documents, you can't get too specific, but you will literally see distrib distributions of ca uh, cash flow distribution, distribution of cash flow, distributions of proceeds or somewhere version of that okay so if you literally if you get a pdf just press Control f type cash flow that might actually that might bring a lot of stuff you might want to type distributions or typically what i advise to people is look only invest in deals that have a preferred return right so before a sponsor doesn't hit a hurdle right like you know for that austin deal we were talking about right mm -hmm. if the sponsor doesn't hit that eight percent hurdle the sponsor doesn't get to share in any of the profits right so what does that do now what that does is that it basically puts a minimum performance level that the sponsor has to meet. Otherwise, right, look, if you're doing straight profit splits, right, where, you know, Sam, you take 70, I'll take 30, right? The issue is when the times are good, basically you've invested all your money and the other person's taken 30% as an example, in this case, money from the start, mm -hmm. right? But all of your money is invested. Mostly none of that guy's money is invested, right? So when the times are bad, you're the one with 100% of the losses, not this person, because he's not going to take money out of his pocket and give it to you during bad times, mm -hmm. right? So that's why that preferred structure is a very institutional friendly structure, because what it does, again, there's many variants of that, but what it does is it puts a minimum level of performance below which a sponsor can, like me, right now me, cannot participate in profit and losses, because why would you compensate somebody for mediocre performance? Mm-hmm. Right. right. Why, if you, if, if somebody is going to be as clueless as, for instance, you are in this particular case, and hell, why don't you do it yourself? Right. Okay. So, so the focus then, actually, so we're going to reference a yeah. uh, a page that that Omar has, has written up on his website. Um, we'll leave a link to it in the show notes. I believe it is boardwalkwealth.com forward slash private dash placement dash memorandum. So great content on that. And so, Omar, it looks like you break it down kind of into three sections. One of yeah. one of one of which is available now. By the time we release this episode, probably the other ones will be yeah. one or or two of the other ones will be available. So, the first uh, category is the regulatory structure. Mm -hmm. The second category is how you get paid, and then the third is your role as a limited partner. And I think you should we should probably expand that. It's not just your role, mm -hmm. but what your expectations should be also. And you want to make sure that your expectations what you actually expect, right? Mm -hmm. You get that in writing or over an email, but it's clearly defined. Because if right. it's not clearly defined, if it's wishy-washy, there's a reason why it's wishy-washy. Got it. So yeah. I'm, I'm just going to read for the listeners just some of the sections that um, yeah. I, I looked at under regulatory structure. We don't have to touch on them all, but just yeah. to give everyone an idea. Some people may have read through PPM materials before. 
some like myself really never, at least not in the last decade. <laughs> well, here are some of the categories. Starting off, class of limited partnership and equity split, use of proceeds, risk factors and conflict of interest, liquidation, 1031 exchange, limited partner agreement, financing, GP, meaning uh, general partner advances and LP loans, limited partners, key principles of, and members of, a gener- of general partners, subscription agreement, type of SEC offering, investment objectives, voting rights, depreciation method used, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. <laughs> so like, that's a lot. Um, yeah. For someone like myself, again, I, I think if I did, you know, more and more deals, I would start paying attention to more of these things. You know, when I read that off to you, what, what immediately are you, Omar, as a sponsor, but also as an investor thinking about what's going through your head uh, in terms of what's important and what you're immediately going to flip your eyes to when you see something? Cool. So I can tell you this. Look, this is assuming that you vetted the sponsor in some shape or form. You mm-hmm. have some sort of a relationship. So, you know, you can say, oh, yeah, I, I looked at their track record or I talked to the guy and I have met this guy multiple times, kind of followed him, you know, all that kind of stuff. Right. This is assuming you've done that level of vetting. Mm-hmm. Right. So once you've done that level of vetting and Sam, you as a high income earner or high net worth, what I would tell is basically from the list that you've described me because you want to be passive because what you don't want to do is do my job. So number one, what I would be looking for <laughs> in your particular, in for your particular case, if you're high net worth or high income, is the depreciation method to be used. Now, it sounds really counterintuitive. Why would you be going there? Again, it's follow the money, mm-hmm. right? Because one of the things, one of the most beautiful things uh, in the U.S. tax code is the straight up the amount of benefits that accrue to real estate investors or real estate people generally. Right. And typically what happens, especially with the latest uh, tax law changes, what happens and I don't know if you saw your K1, you know, when we should do what you will see is that whereas you got income right from your distributions, you you're running a loss right now. So on accounting wise, you're running a loss. So that's why you will never have to pay for that particular year or till you max out your loss. Again, very boring stuff, but very important. You're never going to have to pay income tax on that income. So we're talking how many years? Because I know the let's say the property that that I invested. No, so every in. year, no, but every year you get a K one. A K one yeah. basically is the IRS definition of saying this is like a partnership tax form, right? It's mm-hmm. like for instance, if you invested with Vanguard, right? So every and it's in a taxable, just regular account, right? When your brokerage account. Mm-hmm. So every year Vanguard is going to give you a tax slip, right? Which you're going to then use to basically file for your taxes, mm-hmm. right? So the K-1 is similar thing for partnerships because most private partnerships are, most private assets are assembled as partnerships, right? So what mm-hmm. happens is because we have a lot, this thing called depreciation. Now depreciation is a non, it's not a cash outlay, right? It's an accounting outlay. Mm-hmm. It's just an accounting entry. So typically what happens is what we see with a lot of folks is that for the first two and a half, and again, this is an average, first two and a half, three, four years, while they're making all this income, you know, all the rental income and all of that mm-hmm. kind of stuff, Right. Dude, they're not paying any taxes on that income because mm-hmm. accounting wise, they're running a loss. So how can you pay money on a loss? Hmm. Like you won't pay the IRS more money when you're doing a loss. Right. You only pay money on profits or income. And, so it's one yeah. of it's one of the quirks of the tax law. And it, and you said it, it's typically on average for, uh, for, let's say, a private real estate investment. Uh, it's typically two and a half years that that'll happen. What, you said there's a there's a cap minimum. to it. No, Minimum. well, there's no cap to it. I'm saying typically the average that I've seen for our deals. First of all, there is. Mm-hmm. this is what I want to tell you. There is no standard because this is why you need to know how much of the depreciation will be allocated to you or prorated mm-hmm. what will be your share, right? Mm-hmm. And I'll give you an example. A couple of, like maybe even a decade or two ago when things weren't as sophisticated, for instance, a lot of sponsors would keep all the depreciation benefits for themselves typically and just give out only the cash returns to people because the idea was, look, if you're a doctor or you're a lawyer, you don't you don't have enough real estate income to offset these losses, right? Because if you have $100 of real estate income and you got $1,000 quote unquote of losses, you can only really take $100. And only $900 is left, which you just take to future years, right, as an example. So a lot of folks would keep it to themselves. But now as more and more folks are getting educated, people are starting to realize, look, well, that is my share of the earnings. Now, the earnings just happen to be a loss in this particular case. But I can take that loss and offset it against other pools of income that I have, right? So this is why, you know, what a lot of folks are doing, a lot of doctors, lawyers, engineers, finance people, let's assume they've got a partner 
that that is stay at home, right? Stay at home mom, stay at home dad. They tell their partner, what, what you're going to do, honey, is you're going to become a real estate agent. Now, being a, becoming a real estate agent doesn't necessarily mean you're actually going to sell houses or you actually have to be good at your job. In fact, you could completely suck at your job. You could not even sell one house the entire career that you have as a real estate agent. Because, but because you're a real estate agent now, what happens is you are classified as a real estate professional. Mm-hmm. Now, basically, if you've made your income, say, from working a job, and you've got all this depreciation, right, which typically earlier you could only offset against real estate income. Now what you can do is, let's assume you work a corporate job, you make 150 grand a year, you can take all the depreciation from your real estate income, offset it against all the taxes you pay in your corporate job, and net-net pay like maybe 2% tax for the whole year. Hmm. Right, so this is why we see an explosion of realtors. Right. Every, <laughs> every I'm telling you, every suburban soccer mom or soccer dad suddenly is a real real estate agent. And that's the reason why. Oh, man. I feel like there's a lot of things that I'm just not taking advantage of. All I'm like, saying lot... is that you don't have to be a good real estate. In fact, you don't even have to sell house to be a real yeah. because the government can't tell you to be competent at your job. Mm-hmm. That's very true. Right. You can't tell your business <laughs> to make money either. Yeah. Right. And that's why. This, I feel, especially if you're a high income earner, right, mm-hmm. or a high net worth earner, and you're, you're generating a lot of income from other areas, especially real estate, this, like the cash flow distribution thing, right, it's kind of like follow the money thing, right? Mm-hmm. This is one of the most important things. A lot of people aren't even aware of it. Uh, there's kind of this theory recently that, uh, well, we keep continuously hearing that all these super high net wealth people put a lot or let's say a majority of their investments into real estate for some uh-huh. of the reasons that we're discussing. This is a reason, this is a reason De- why there is yeah. no other reason apart from this. So it's, it's basically depreciation plus I think also maybe a, a second layer to that is the ability to do the, the 1031 exchange. Yeah. Yeah. But depreciation is a big one, man. Cause look, if you make anything over six figures a year, right. You're presumably playing 50, 60 grand. Let's assume, you know, between, uh, uh, a typical corporate couple, right? They're in their mid-40s, uh, getting into their 40s, high income earning years. That typical corporate sort of couple is making two hundred fifty dollars to $300,000 a year. That's just the way it is, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm talking, like, you know, typical uh, jobs, corporate, like HR, accounting, finance, law, engineering, that sort of stuff, right? So mm-hmm. presumably, if you're making, say, two hundred. dollars say $200,000 a year, let's keep it simple, right? At a 30% tax rate, which by the way is really low, you pay a lot more than that, is $60,000 a year in taxes or $5,000 a month in taxes, Hmm. right? Now think about it this way, man. If you are able to half your tax bill, and and I'm not saying you have to presumably change anything in your life, okay? This doesn't mean that you suddenly change careers and I don't know, you learn, you go to college for a new degree. This is by changing minor things along the way. Even if you half your tax bill, and that's thirty grand a year, that's two and a half thousand dollars in your pocket every month. Are you freaking telling me that the average couple, average average upper middle class couple in America, making two hundred thousand dollars a year, they wouldn't be happy with an extra thirty grand a year? Hell, a millionaire would be happy with an extra thirty grand a year. Yes, yes, and and I mean, think about it. That... An, extra, an extra thirty grand a year is the equivalent of say every year without changing anything in your lifestyle, without changing savings, spendings, whatever. Every year, you can basically pay for a kid's college. And so, therefore, one of your big, one of typically, you know, most educated families' biggest problems, college education, right? You solve mm-hmm. that problem by making minor tweaks along the way. And that's through investing, creating some of that income through real estate, real estate right? And, and, then use, and then using your depreciation write-offs to just write off that income, right? And again, mm-hmm. this is an accounting thing. This isn't like... a this is. This doesn't mean. This has nothing to do with the kind of cash you get in your pocket. Okay. So you could mm-hmm. be getting, say, thirty thousand dollars cash in deposited in your bank account. Literally, you could go spend it buying Gucci handbags. The government doesn't care. But you have thirty thousand dollars of real estate income. You and you have thirty thousand dollars of depreciation losses from real estate. You offset that. You paid zero taxes. You can do whatever you want with your money. And then you have to you you have to pay that at some point when you sell the property, but it's at a much more uh, it's at advantageous a, pa- tax bracket, right? 
not only is it advantageous because it's capital gains versus uh, income tax, number one, right? Mm-hmm. So right off the top, you get a subsidy basically on your in, uh, on the tax that you've done. But also if you're able to roll it in through 1031 exchanges, mm-hmm. and if you do it the right way, man, you can basically die, pass this on to your kids and they never have to pay taxes. This is I, this has been running through my head recently, right? I, and I kind of thought of this theory without someone directly telling it to me, but I'm like, it seems like you could do the depreciation, sell mm-hmm. the property, or the maybe the fund yeah. is liquidated. You roll yeah. that t- through a 1031 into a new fund or property, and you just yeah. do that for the next whatever, 50 years. Yeah. And you, you're, you're almost collecting tax-free income for your whole life, and then you pass that on to your heirs and I, yeah. don't, I don't know what happens then but it seems like nothing happens then what they do is they get so they get they it's called a stepped up basis so what they get it as is the price at which you passed it on to them when you died mm-hmm. so they have to pay no taxes and by the way lots and lots and lots and lots of high net worth families that pass their money through intergenerational wealth transfers of wealth this is what they do this, this is, is by the way no, no, for real. This is, and by the way, this isn't even complex tax strategy that, you know, you, you need to hire an army of accountants to do. This is literally a freebie. And if you're making anything over, say, 150 or even $100,000 a year and you plan it accordingly, it might take you a little while. If you don't take advantage of this, I mean, this literally might be the only free lunch in the world left. Well, uh, I'm not doing this stuff, but I should be. I mean, I should have been doing this. Well, Sam, how many kids you got, man? Uh, none. However, kids that you know of. Kids that you know of. <laughs> still none. Thank you, Omar. Okay. However, uh, I don't need to have kids now to start planning for this, right? I can start doing it now, and with the intention of one day there'll be someone there that I can leave it to. Or look, uh, even if it's not, even if it's not a kid, how about you wanted to pass it on to say your niece, your nephew, a charitable trust? I mean, yeah. I mean, look, once you're dead, you don't really care as long as somebody you like, love, and trust gets some sort of benefit, right? That's right. And it's it's part of the game. I mean, it's part of the game. You want to you dude, be is, in the game no, no, and you want to be winning is, the game, you know? Yeah. There, dude, there is no game. They have literally spelled it out for you. Now, if you and I choose to willingly not take advantage of this thing, I mean, that's something else, right? But well, there is, yeah. this is, yeah, but this is, this is not a rich, we're taking advantage of the poor sort of game. Man, I know guys, for instance, who who started buying a house, right? Old guys, obviously, they're way older than I am. They started, say, you know, buying a house. One guy was actually a plumber, and one guy was an electrician. They started buying a couple of houses, you know, in the 70s and 80s. And by the way, in the 80s, you had double-digit in- inflation and interest rates, okay? So nobody mm-hmm. can tell me this is the hardest thing in the world, okay? And, you know, over a period of time, they, they were judicious with their money. They, they, they spent less than they made. They judiciously saved their money. They kind of kept rolling and rolling and rolling. And these are, by the way, quote, unquote, what people would call not sophisticated investors, just rel- regular folks, right? And over mm-hmm. a 20, 30-year period, without trying to do something super fancy, super complicated, man, you're sitting on a couple of million dollars, man. Mm. And this is, and by the way, this is not doing anything fancy. Yeah. But, okay, 1031 exchange. I think we're going to have to change the episode title of, of this from PPM material to 1031 no, exchange of depreciation because yeah, it's so much more interesting. Biggest, yeah, this is one of the biggest advantages, right? So mm-hmm. the point I was trying to earlier make was that, look, you want to see that you're getting some depreciation accounted to you because, look, this is a contract. As long as two parties agree that this is a contract, for instance, a sponsor can say, I'm keeping 100% of the depreciation, mm-hmm. right? And if you've agreed to it, well, presumably you've agreed to it, right? And to give you an idea, a lot of more sophisticated folks, what they even start doing is they start selling the depreciation benefits separate from the income benefit. So I'll give you Ooh. an example. So Ooh, I'll give you an example, right? For instance, I have a client out in Florida, a very, very well-to-do person, right? And his problem is the exact opposite of my problem, right? Now, his problem is because he's older, he's judiciously run his business, is very nice person, right? So his problem is that he has a lot of income, but not a lot of tax uh, write-offs against that income, right? So every year he's getting pummeled with taxes. And mm-hmm. my issue is that I've got a lot of tax benefit, tax write-offs, but I obviously <laughs> don't have enough income because I'm just starting out. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you structure deals the right way, he can, for instance, come in, give me money, for instance, to finance my deals. He gets a tax benefits. 
I get the income benefits. Now, this way, you're literally taking the same pool of money and benefits, but now two people are benefiting in the way that they want to benefit, not necessarily in the way that is some standardized way of doing it, right? So then you get what you want, I get what I want, everybody's a happy camper. And net net, mm-hmm. both of us come out ahead. Right. Now, in, in the depreciation clause in PPM materials, what would be standard and fair? I know, again, we, we said there's not anything standard, so but what would be typically the, fair for both for so, both parties? So, first of all, there is no concept of fairness, man. You know this mm-hmm. in the world, right? <laughs> fairness doesn't exist. But what I typically suggest people is, look, this is what we do. This is nowhere, I'm not saying this is an industry standard or a best practice, but what I felt having worked in the public markets, what I felt was a best practice. And the reason why I'm saying this is because, you know, I know you invest in Vanguard. This is my exact problem when I started doing this work. Look, I am because I worked on the capital market side. My family is fairly financially sophisticated, right? But it was so hard that I know all these terms. And when I would talk to a lot of sponsors, they would try to just throw all these big words out at you, right? In the sense that you would just shut up and not ask questions. And they would have like minimal, if any, disclosure. And you had to, it was like pulling teeth from people, right? So this is literally in our deals, literally I'm using one of my own PPMs, man. So there is literally, I have nowhere to run, right? It's, you just open the kimono 100%. Because that was one of my things. I was like, look, people aren't stupid anymore. Right. So what you need to have is low fees and a high equity structure. Right. So you get compensated for performance, not necessarily for, hey, can you just nickel and dine somebody to death? So that being said, typically what we do is because our structure is a 70 30 split above a preferred return. So you get an 8 percent preferred return. Then you have a 70 30 split, which is 70 goes to the investors, 30 comes to us. Right. In profits. So typically what we tell people is, look, at least do that. This is what we do because we feel depreciation is also one of the benefits of your investment, right? So mm-hmm. if you're sharing the profit 70-30, well, presumably we should share the other benefits with you 70-30 as well, right? Now, yeah, look, I can make it 100% go to me, but that's not really fair to you long-term, right? Mm-hmm. Because you, you're the one financing this thing. So typically yeah. what we tell is, look, look at least in the split that you have uh, profits-wise, look at it that. In our particular case, it's 70-30. I suggest that you should go 70-30. But at least you should have 50%, man. I mean, come on, give me a break. So, you know, okay. anybody, so, and, and anybody tells you otherwise, just, just, just you don't want to deal with that person. Or they better have a really good reason. So in the de- depreciation clause, it would actually say these benefits are split 60-40, 70-30, whatever? Yeah, it wouldn't say it that clearly. What typically it would say is uh, the depreciation benefits are similar to, say, the waterfall structure or some version of that. But again, if it's not clear, because... Again, sometimes it's not the sponsor's fault also, right? Because every lawyer has their own way of writing it, right? Mm -hmm. You just want to get it in writing. Be like, look, dude, this is pretty good. All these big words are pretty good. Literally tell me if we have $100 of, literally say it like that. If we have $100 of depreciation benefits or like uh, depreciation write-offs, what percentage goes to you? What percentage comes to me? And if the Mm -hmm. guy cannot literally give you two numbers, this means either the guy's again is either incompetent or he's trying to hide something from you. That's it. That is quite literally how simple it should be. Hey, Sam, you email me, say, hey, Omar, $100 for depreciation allowances, right? Mm-hmm. What percentage comes to me? What percentage goes to you? That's it. And I'm going to write, Sam, you is equal to 70%. Me is equal to 30%. That's the extent of what my reply should be. I'm going to try this after the episode <laughs> with yeah, you. you. Should. <laughs> yeah, you should. <laughs> What, from your experience, how many people? Let's, let's, uh, how many investors do you have in a typical deal that you do? A hundred? So typically, 50? Uh, so no, so typically between thirty-five to about seventy people. We try to restrict it because uh, it's just herding sheep or herding cattle after yeah. a while. That's why. Let's say fifty people on average. You put out the PPM material. How many people of that fifty come back with with questions about it? Zero, which is or one, which is so shocking because I like I think I'm on a soapbox standing every webinar. I say, hey, guys, I want you to read your PPM. Please ask me questions about your PPM. I understand you worked really hard for your money. Look, I have worked really hard for my money. So I understand the sweat, blood and tears you guys have sacrificed. Please, if you have a question, ask me. Crickets. That means nobody reads it. I'm telling you, I mean, I don't blame why they don't read it, but I read it because every time <laughs> I invest with somebody, I read it. And every time that you've read it, you've asked a question right? Oh, yeah. Like, dude, I do this for a living and I ask a question every single time yeah. I read it. 
So, so that means if, if nobody asks a question, it means nobody's read it. I would, I would say that means no one's read it. Cause my question yeah. was going to be how many people on average read this stuff? Cause I don't read it, but maybe I'm an out, maybe, maybe no, I'm you're just... not an outlier. It, it's yeah. actually shocking to me because, because uh, every time you have a question with people, they're like, you, it sounds like you work really hard for your money. Yeah. So you're not, you're just going to sign a document without reading it. You're giving me 200 grand and you're not going to read it because look, I know it looks at I'm not trying to virtue signal here, but look, I know I'm honest, right? Mm -hmm. But my point is you can't go through your entire life assuming that thing. Now, my point is the other point also, you can't go through your entire life thinking people are going to screw you. But my point is trust but verify, right? Just ask yeah. a simple question and just get a simple answer. And that's it. That's the end of that conversation. And I think you're right, too, that a lot of this is probably a reflection on the fact that we've been in a bull market and there hasn't been a lot of people with horror yeah. stories in the last decade. Um, yeah. but, but what I've realized over the last decade is that after my first business, I'm like, Oh, I've got, I've got this money game cracked. This is easy. <laughs> like yeah. I'm gonna go out and just triple up in the next year and triple up from there. And what I realized in the last, especially eight years is like making money is freaking hard. Like, you dude, know, making just money because you do it once doesn't making, mean you do it again. Yeah. yeah. Dude, making money is hard. And then making money on money is even harder. Yeah. Just maintaining what you have is yeah. hard. And, and so, Oh Yeah. I, I've started looking at this stuff, like all the new deals that I'm getting to, I've started looking at much more detailed because I'm like, it, so at some point, the market's going to go down and people are going to get hurt. And I know how hard it is to go out and make new money. So what I have, I need to start protecting because I'm still young. Like this has to, oh, yeah. I have to face the reality that I might not ever make a paycheck again. And yeah. we could go through a 10 year recession where it's, where everything I have gets chopped in half and there's, it's not possible to go out and and make uh, a paycheck. So I, like, you need to be thinking about these things, right? And I've started oh, kind yeah. of internalizing that message recently a lot more. And look, what I, what I, look, this is just coming from me. Look, I am a sponsor. Look, if you think about it, it hurts me to be transparent, right? Because the more transparent I am, the more my kimono I open, the more people are gonna ask questions, right? It hurts mm -hmm. me if I'm, I'm literally telling you, as a sponsor, this is what the thinking was. Well, why do we want to tell investors more stuff? Because you know, they're just going to ask questions, blah, 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 right? Man, you want to stand out for the right reasons. And look, at the end of the day, there's so many things that can go wrong. And presumably over a five, 10 year horizon, things will go wrong. So mm -hmm. this is why I personally feel you need an educated investor base because they also have to realize that it's not sunshine and rainbows all the time, right? So things, may, things might go wrong. But if they're yeah. educated, they have a knowledge up front, there are less chances of mistakes happening or misunderstandings happening along the way, right? Where they assume one thing and then you, I will obviously come back as a sponsor. Well, oh, you know, it's written in your legal document and then it becomes a he said, she said sort of a deal, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it leaves a bad taste in everybody's mouth. That makes sense. So you want to actually, as a sponsor, you want not just, you don't want necessarily quick commits. You want an educated investor group so that if in the chance that things are not perfect, it's, you know, there's a, there's a better, uh, bar of expectations and an understanding going into that. Yeah, I can see that. And look, the, and look, look, man, the other deal also is Sam, I realize, man, uh, just because I was lucky enough to be in an environment growing up where this was, well, this was somewhat common, not extremely common, but my family was aware of these things. We were an entrepreneurial family. We participated in the capital markets across private placements, all that stuff. Just because I know of it doesn't mean everybody else knows of it. The same way, for mm -hmm. instance, that, uh, you know, I can't come do your job, right? So when I come to you and ask you an opinion about something, I am trusting you that you're going to give me the right answer, right? Or the right answer that you know of. So mm -hmm. I think it's an ethical responsibility also, more than the having the educated investors and all of that. Because, look, man, I've worked really hard for my money. And I know you have worked hard for your money. So why not just treat everybody with respect? You, and people are make... educated, man. People can, will find out. People are educated. People are not stupid anymore. So just start off at the right footing. You, you Canadian guys are all right, Omar. I got to say it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I live in the U.S. I'm getting corrupted now. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Greed. Yeah. Greed. So let's, let's put you on the hot seat real quick for, I'm just going to say the category of the regulatory structure. You yeah. say whatever comes to your mind in terms of things to look out for, or if you want to say something about best practices, just to give the listeners to reference something. All right. Sure. 
And we can All edit right. my answers, right? So I don't give you stupid Yeah, answers. okay. That's right. Yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll edit in perfect responses, yeah. scripted responses. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, class of limited partners and equity split. Something to be careful of or, or, or best practices. What do you say? Look, I would suggest as long as you vetted the sponsor, this shouldn't be as much of an issue. Look, unless you're... Unless this is like some super complex deal, in which case you should already know these things, but typically no typical real estate transactions, the type at least we're doing, uh, they usually have two, maybe three classes of shares and that's it, basically. Mm -hmm. And typically investors don't have as much of a say because they're passive investors. So this isn't as much of an issue assuming you wetted the sponsor. Okay. And then typical equity spl uh, splits or best practices? So typical equity splits, what I would tell people is that any sponsor on the planet who tells you that they're going to have a straight profit split, right? So 70, 38, it doesn't even matter what the profit split is, right? If they say, hey, mm -hmm. for every dollar we make, you get, say, 80 and I get 20, some version of that. Yeah, literally just run away from that person. Anybody okay. on the planet after this who gives you a straight profit split, just run away from that person. Because, again, either that person's incompetent or that person's disingenuous. So typically, for the retail investor, right now what you should be looking at as a best practice, by the way, this is an institutionally preferred model. So this is when you're having sophisticated private equity people do it. This is a type of model they're looking at. You want to have a preferred return, number one. Typically in the market right now, you're seeing between 8 to 10% preferred returns. Now preferred basically means, again, as we talked earlier, that this is the minimum hurdle before which uh, a sponsor, which is me, cannot participate in profit profit and loss sharing, right? So you get a preferred return, then after that you get a split, which is say 70, 30, 80, 20, whatever that is. But you need to have a preferred. And no matter what somebody, there's actually an article, not to plug my own website, there's an article on our blog which says, uh, waterfalls, how the real money is made in private real estate, private equity. If you don't have a preferred, you are asking for trouble when times are bad. Got it, okay, lot to digest. I like what your answer was. I'm gonna go back and re-listen to that. Number two, use of proceeds. What do you have to say, Omar? See, this is somewhat typical. Essentially, all you're seeing is that people aren't basically taking their kids to Disneyland based on the use of proceeds. Essentially, <laughs> something like that, right? Okay. As long as somebody's not doing it, as long as it's a legitimate business expense, you're good to go. All right. And is that in use of proceeds, is it going to be spelled out like we're using... 10% to rebuild a gym or is it just like general? No, what, no what it depends doing. on the, no, it, it should be general because if you start itemizing everything, you're going to, this, this thing is going to go over yeah. like 300 pages. So it's typical, right? You know, closing costs are this much, purchase price is this much, renovation budget is this much, uh, XYZ okay. stuff is that, much. you know, cool. general business reimbursements are this much, you know. All right. Uh, risk factors, conflicts of interest. Anything there worth thinking of? This is, this is, look, if you've read one, you've probably read all of them. This is just typical boilerplate stuff. But again, read it for the first time. Sounds terrible. That, I'm, I'm not going to read it's, it. It's, it's freaking awful. I'm telling you. <laughs> okay. D, liquidation. What do we got? Uh, liquidation's got to be a good, something good. It sounds liquid. Yeah, this basically, look, typically it's going to tell you that, look, this is not a liquid investment. This is not like the stock market where, you know, if you want some money, you can just cash out. Typically, these are illiquid assets or illiquid investments. So typically, it just spells that out, right? Okay. Because invariably, everybody is six months from now, one person is like, well... I don't know, I got XYZ expense to pay. Can you just liquidate my uh, shares? And you're like, nah, bro, shit don't work like that. Yeah, hold on, hold on to the yeah. end. Hold yeah. on until that 1031 exchange, which is the next or, category. Or what happens, by the way, is like I got a call from one of the guys I know. One of his investors wants to liquidate. So basically, he, they're looking for another investor to substitute for this investor. But to incentivize another investor, this person, 100,000, he'll have to take a discount. So he might have to sell his 100,000 share for 80,000 to induce a new person to come in. All which right. doesn't really I, happen. They're trying it because they're, you know, they're nice people. We know these people will try and help them out. But typically it doesn't happen. I've seen that in a fund that I'm in where they sent out an email to the other investors or I guess you call them limited partners. Yeah. Said so-and-so needs uh, to get out, has a cash need, and they're willing to sell their shares at like 90 cents on the dollar. So I guess they do that in a lot of cases just to try to accommodate a limited partner yeah but that's a nice thing they do that's not an expected that's not something you can expect is going to happen okay 1031 exchange what would we need to know there now that we know that how important that that potentially is well typically what you need to know there is that 50 percent uh voting rights we're talking voting rights here right 50 percent of the voting uh has to be from the limited partner has to agree 
uh, has to they have to be on board with actually doing a 1031 exchange for you to do a 1031 exchange. So let's assume if 51% of the people say, yeah, let's do a 1031 exchange. You can do a 1031 exchange and let's use Sam. You don't want to do a 1031 exchange for whatever reason, right? You mm-hmm. can still opt out of that. Hmm. So let's let's say in Walnut Creek, which I'm invested in, if if and when that fund eventually winds up or that property, whatever it is, uh, winds up and and is liquidated, can I not just do a 1031 exchange on my own? Like I can just go buy a, another property. It has to be, actually no. be voted in. No, in this particular case, because uh, the way this was set up is that you bought shares into a property. You didn't buy the property. Mm-hmm. Right, you bought shares into a property, which is a different thing. I, I know it sounds legal mumbo jumbo, but it's a different thing. So in that particular case, 50% of the limited partners would have to 50% or more, actually one more vote than 50%, would mm-hmm. have to agree that we want to do a 1031 exchange, and then you and then you know the partnership can then do a 1031 exchange into a new asset. But again, if you're a guy or a girl and you don't want to do a 1031 exchange for whatever reason, you can still opt out of that. Okay. So nobody's forcing you to do a 1031. Oh, okay. So typically I like that. people yeah, but typically people do want to do a 1031. So it's not really a problem for the people who want to do it and it's not a problem for the people who don't want to do it. Makes sense. How about financing? It seems like there might be something interesting there, something to be careful yeah. of if the company's taken on a lot of debt, would it be spelled oh, yeah. out there? Yeah, it better be. Okay. You know, and you should also see it in your sources and uses, right? When we talked earlier sources and uses because what you would basically see is, hey, what is the debt they're taking on to finance this asset? Now, typically, high debt is both good or bad, but it depends on the asset. So as an example, if some asset is extremely mismanaged or poorly run and there's just a lot of juice, right? So then what you would do is you would typically take a higher leverage short-term financing, get all your business plan done, so then you can move to a permanent financing sort of a deal, right? Low leverage permanent financing. But for instance, if you have an asset, that's just basically a stabilized asset. You know, it's just a coupon clipper, right? You just clip a coupon. You just keep getting your rent checks, right? In that particular case, you might not want to go for a high leverage loan. You just want to go for a lower leverage, longer term financing role. So again, uh, debt is very dependent on what the business plan is. Mm-hmm. So what, for instance, presumably what somebody can't tell you is, oh, this is a really stable asset. You're just going to be a coupon clipper. And then they load on 90% debt on it, okay. right? It's not going to work that way. But if there's a lot of juice on the property and there's a business plan is, hey, X, Y, Z is a reason. And again, not going to bore you to death. X, Y, Z is a reason why there's so much juice on the property. And that's why we're going to get a higher leverage loan. So we can just come in and do everything, you know, full speed and then refinance into very nice long term financing. Got it. Got it. Makes sense. What about uh, the type of SEC offering, 506B versus 506C? Does that actually matter that much to the individual investor? Or is that more just for disclosure purposes? That's specifically more for disclosure purposes. But from the perspective of, say, a sponsor, which is me, what it does is basically that 506C means that I can only basically take accredited investors in the offering, which is basically this thing. 506B means that I can take some level of sophisticated investors. Again, not going to bore you to death with the de- definitions. So that's basically it. I mean, look, again, if you wetted the sponsor, if you wetted the cash distribution, you feel the cash distributions are fine, the depreciation is fine. Yeah, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. Okay. Let's kind of close it out with a recap on one of the last ones of the regulatory structure, which is the depreciation method used is that talking about the depreciation benefit split like we were talking about earlier is that it's a different different thing no what happens in this particular case is again not to belabor a point what happens is uh what you should be seeing for bigger assets actually even smaller assets now is that just because of time value of money right because a dollar received today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow most sponsors use uh the strategy called cost segregation again what it basically does is it uses a tax code to front load a lot of depreciations. You can get all the depre- you can get even more depreciation benefits, right? Now you're not forced to do it. You're not. There's no law that says you got to do it. But if you're going to hold an asset for three to five years, why wouldn't you do it, right? So you better make sure the guy's going to do it or the mm-hmm. person running this thing is going to do it because just it's it's really low cost. Look, if you have a ten, twenty million, thirty million dollar asset, like for this the Jacksonville deal. I think it ended, it was about close to about $14, $15 million, and it ended up costing us about $7,000 to do it. Hmm. So if you think about it, it's, it's an inconsequential amount of money for the amount of benefits you're going to get based on the size of the project, right? So if it's like $6,500, $7,000, just, just, just do it. Yeah. 
All right. Well, when it comes down to the final PPM docs and materials, Omar, like typically when should an investor expect to see these in the investment process? Mm-hmm. It's uh, it, I guess this is all something that they need to read before or yeah. read, sign, uh, and then transfer money. Is that kind of the, the yes, standard course? Yes, yes. In fact, read, ask questions, and understand the answer. If the answer is kind of, again, not in simple grade five thing, fifth English, ask the question again. And if the answer is still the same, don't even go ahead, right? But assuming the answer is in clear English, clearly spelled out, you read again, then sign their documents. And as a lot of people, which I believe they should be doing, they involve their lawyers. The only bad point about involving your lawyers, again, is that most lawyers that most people have, because most of us aren't billionaires, most mm-hmm. of us have like personal injury lawyers or like, hey, I, I don't know, my business needs to have a contract. So a lot of those lawyers, they're not really trained to read these documents. So they'll be like, oh, no, 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 this doesn't work. This doesn't work. This doesn't work. Right. So as long as you're kind of aware of that, because what you can't do as a personal injury or divorce lawyer cannot be reading a securities uh, document. Right. They, they, they're not trained to do that. Nothing against lawyers. They're just not trained to do it. Right. So most people typically ask their accountant. Again, the accountant is the same issue with the lawyer. If they're not trained to do this, they're just like, oh, this just seems really weird. And you're like, OK, bro, maybe you need to be educated. <laughs> so short of that, uh, read, uh, read, ask questions, read again, get answers, then sign the documents. Once you have been provided a countersigned copy from the sponsor, then and only then transfer money. Transferring the money comes right at the end. In fact, if somebody is pressurizing you to transfer the money first, just send their emails to spam. Very easy. <laughs> Never going to hear from that person again. Well, I would encourage everyone to read through these docs. I have not yet, but I'm starting to take it definitely more seriously. And it's actually kind of scary to hear that only one in 50 maybe will ask a question, which is an indication of how many people read it. But also that is a testament to you, Omar, because I'm sure they have a lot of faith and trust in you. I, I hope in the future there's more of a kind of crowd due diligence in a sense where I know there are some resources out there. I know some of these platforms out there have made this um, a little bit easier because you can certainly get some some chat and forum groups going mm-hmm. regarding some sponsors. And I think that's really important, especially for the the kind of everyday uh, yeah, there's one problem investor with that, like myself. Sam. Mm-hmm. Sam, there's only one problem with that. A lot of that chatting happens after the fact. So after, after the money's you sent been your money, <laughs> yeah. after the money's been transferred, you want to have a lot of these chats before the money's been transferred, mm-hmm. right? So as long as you mm-hmm. do that, again, not trying to scare, just trying to say, look, there's when the market's going up, everybody thinks they're a genius. You just want to make sure you work hard for your money. You're just educated and you know what's going to happen with your money. And that's that. And that is it. You worked hard for your money. We worked hard for the money. Now let's go out and yeah. make some money. Let's make some money. Let's make a lot of money. Let's do it, Omar. Thanks for coming back on the show. It's been good to have you on as a repeat uh, guest and um, look forward to sharing it. We'll keep that link that uh, we got this material originally in the show notes. And everyone, I encourage you to take a look at that. Get your general education on PPM materials. And then we can go out and invest in real estate and other types of assets a lot more confidently. Omar, thanks a lot. And uh, we'll catch you soon, buddy. Appreciate you. My pleasure, Sam. Thank you so much. Wow, so much good information there. But right before we dive in, I want to quickly thank everyone who's been leaving reviews of the podcast on iTunes because you are the reason why we are growing so fast. I think every day we have 10 people join the Boss Lounge. So if you haven't already, go to investlikeaboss.com, click on, I don't know, probably bonus or something so you can or sign for the email list. You get an invite to the Boss Lounge, which is our Facebook group. And I want to quickly thank Dean Kaufman, says five stars, lots of great investing ideas. Been listening since day one. You have made many investments. I have made many investments as a direct result of hearing ideas from the podcast. Keep up the great work. So Sam, what did you think of all these new terms and kind of just knowledge that Omar just dropped on us? Yeah, I thought, of course, the the tax savings and the reasons why uh, and how to utilize the 1031 exchange more properly and just the amount of money that can be saved once you get into becoming a high income earner and you can take advantage of these tax savings. If you can cut your tax rate on a lot of your income from 40% to 20%, you, you can theoretically save millions of dollars a year, which is crazy. Yeah, definitely. Like, I, I think just that part of it was a big eye opener and why a lot of wealthy people love real estate so much. It's It really is because of the, the tax advantages that we can get, uh, especially if you have another source of 
income in the U.S., whether you're a doctor or a lawyer or something like that. Yeah. Uh, in fact, if our attorney, our attorneys, I hope, well, maybe our attorneys are listening as well, but if our CPAs, mine's uh, Mario Lucibello, if he's listening to this, please shoot me an email, tell me what I can do to take or get more tax savings through property. I don't, I just don't think I'm invested enough in property. Uh, in the paper stuff, the REITs I am, but in physical property that is producing income, I haven't really gotten that much into it. I did get more into it at the end of last year. So I'm looking forward to some of those tax savings. But I think there's just so much more I could be doing with this. Yeah, definitely. For me, because I'm out of the U.S., I'm taking advantage of the foreign income exclusion. I'm not too worried about trying to save, you know, have write-offs or tax savings through real estate. But I know that if I ever move back to the U.S., that's going to be my big focus where – Basically, if you live in the U.S., there's no way of getting around, you know, around not paying taxes except mm-hmm. to write off these losses and to take all the kind of deductions from real estate. And that's why people do it. Yeah, that's a really good point, Johnny. And and for any of the listeners that are not familiar with foreign, it's always a tongue twister, foreign earned income tax exclusion. You basically get the first hundred thousand to a little bit more, maybe up to one hundred twenty thousand tax free if you live outside the U.S. So most of Johnny's income is tax-free, right? Yeah. But if you move back to the U.S., then you wouldn't be able to take advantage of that, which means you'd have a lot. You'd have a lot of taxable income, and that's when investing in property, you'd actually be able to to get probably a similar advantage uh, as you're currently getting outside the the USA. Yeah, it definitely wouldn't be as straightforward and easy uh, as what I'm doing now. But I, I think when you're saving, you know, thirty grand or more, it's worth. Trying, you know, trying to figure out a way to to do it. Uh, one caveat, though, of what he had mentioned, he's right that currently you can basically be a terrible investor, a terrible real estate agent, and still be able to write write off write off uh, taxes. But I know the IRS, they you know they ha- like they they want to incentivize people to invest in real estate, and that's why they have these breaks. At the same time, they don't want people screwing them over, so they're pretty smart about it. And I know for. Sh- for a fact that with like a ton of people sign up for these like multi-level marketing companies just to just to be able to like start their own business and write things off and it worked for about for the first two years where you know they're taking a huge loss from just you know like throwing money away to these like MLM mm-hmm. companies but after the second year the IRS comes back and says look you can't write these things off anymore because like if you're not creating if you're not like earning money from this, it's not a job, it's not a profession, it's a hobby. And right. they crack down hard on M- like MMOs. And I have a feeling they're going to do the same with uh, real estate investors unless you're actually making money. So I think it's a little bit easier be- uh, for real estate because obviously you have cash flow if you're investing in something and you know money's coming in. While like an MOM, you know, literally it might have zero cash flow. So that's very kind yeah. of clear. But well, you also have to remember. You also have to remember the tax code was not written by the IRS. It was written by capitalists that put that elected the <laughs> IRS or hired the IRS. And most of the rich people in the USA and most of the people in political power, a lot of their wealth is in property. And I'm pretty sure that all of them will be batting to try to protect that. Where most of the wealthy people in the U.S. and most of the politicians in the U.S. are not involved in multi-level marketing campaigns of any sort. So I'm sure property, it, as taxes probably continue to creep up in the US, I bet property and property tax advantages will be one of the last, you know, the last opportunities for tax savings, because I think everyone's going to go to bat to try to keep that as tax advantage as possible. Yeah, I, I could definitely see that, you know, and as long as you're actually investing and you're making money, then everybody wins. So I'm actually like really happy right. with that. And a lot of people also don't realize that property investors do good for the world and do good for the economy. I think we always hear kind of the negative press about, you know, um, gentrification or pushing people out of like low income homes. And, but what it is, is it's a cycle where places get run down, investors come, they buy the buildings, they fix them up, then they raise the rent to what it should be if the place wasn't run down. And, then the cycle kind of starts, you know, and then they sell the property. The next person does the same thing, and it kind of just it go it just keeps going. And I think if there weren't property investors and people kind of just left things the way they were and left rent really low, like places would just become slums. 
So I understand mm-hmm. that it sucks when someone's rent get you know gets raised, but at the same time, it's probably good for the the city or, or society you know for for that to happen. And, and long term, I think if you look long term and put aside the the daily emotions, if you think about five years out, ten years out, is it better for the world? I would say absolutely, without a doubt. And if that's the goal of mankind to create a better society for all, then it's probably a good thing. Yeah, I just watched this piece about um, pushing like artists out of San Francisco, and the guy they interviewed. I, I don't know if they did this ironically, or this is just the best example they could find. This guy was complaining, saying that he's lived in San Francisco for thirty years, and they tried to raise his rent by you know five hundred percent or something like that. And then you find out that he's living in the heart of San Francisco in like a three bedroom, like nice apartment. And he's paying $600 a month <laughs> for a rent controlled unit. And he's pissed off because they, they want to charge him 3000 now and he can't afford it. So he has to leave. But it's like, come on, man, you lived there for 30 years. Like either you should have been saving up to buy a place yourself or, you know, like you just have to like, or they should have been raising your rent, you know, like 50 bucks or a hundred bucks yeah. a year. And it should have kind of caught up to market rate anyways, you know, you know, and I understand it's a huge jump, but at the same time, like, come on, man. Like, do, does he really think it's fair that he's paying 600 bucks a month? Yeah. It's like, Hey man, you just got to move like 10 miles up the road. Look at Johnny. He had to move a- across the entire globe to find a place to rent for $300 a month <laughs> so he could survive. Yeah. <laughs> And you know what? Like, that's kind of the way it is, you know? Like, I, that's probably a discussion for a whole other topic, another podcast. But yeah. I think a lot of – there's a lot of kind of negative publicity for real estate investing. But mm-hmm. I think of it as, like, largely good for the world, especially over the long run. Right. And yeah. if you guys want to hear more about kind of thoughts on this, we had an episode on Opportunity Zones. Uh, it's a big – initiative that's happening right now in the USA. It gives people basically the opportunity to invest in, I don't know, what. how would you classify it? Low-income areas? Basically, yeah, like, yeah, areas crappy areas. That, <laughs> yeah, crappy areas of every single state. So I think every single state in the US has has allocated 13% of the state to this opportunity, zone opportunity. Uh, you can check it out, but it, we, Johnny and I talk a lot about gentrification and some of these topics as well. But I think just kind of in summary for this episode and, and talking a little bit about the importance of PPM materials, it's boring to get through. As Omar said, I, he said basically nobody reads it. So at least we're for all the us that don't read it, we're in good company. But he had a really good point that the market's been in this inc- incredible bull run. Uh, basically, since you and I have been investing, Johnny, I think both of us probably started uh, during the last recession. But while the market's going up, everyone looks smart. Not too many people get stung, but if we have a big, a big pullback, all the p- companies that have not put together good PPM materials or not had fair deal structure, it's all going to be revealed and people are going to get stung. So I've realized in the last five years that making money is not nearly as easy as I originally thought it was. If you have a <laughs> primary income stream and you can build on it, then it can be relatively easy. But if you're starting from scratch and and trying to you know build a new business from from zero is really really challenging. So I've started looking at all these investments a little bit closer and started reviewing the material a lot better. And when I'm not sure, I, I have Mario, my CPA, look at it or an attorney. I think it's really important not to just follow the crowd. There's a lot of good information that you can get from the crowd. That, that's one level of due diligence. But hey, if you're going to stroke that check and to get into one of these funds that have higher limits do the work, you know, spend a day, spend a few hundred dollars to have an, a CPA look it over and uh, and have some primary checks because that way if things do go wrong, you'll at least feel better about it. Yeah, definitely. And I think one one thing I would tell my, my lawyer before he looks at it is say, because I, I think sometimes they feel like if you're going to pay them, you know, a hundred bucks or 300 bucks, that they should tell you something, right? They should like find some, like find some error, even though they have to kind of make something up. You know, just just so like they feel useful, they they don't just look at it, and, you know, and be like, oh, everything's okay. I think I would actually just tell them, say, look, look, in the ideal situation, you would just look look it over and just say everything's okay. Like <laughs> I'm okay with that. Like mm-hmm. you know, but if you actually see a big flag, then let me know. But it, as long as everything's okay, like don't worry about just telling me like everything's okay. I'm happy to pay you for that. Yeah, and I think also another just important part is always look at the background of whoever's putting the deal together. Who are they in business with? 
what's their history, how many deals have they done, how many investors have they, you know, had invested in them, and as importantly, ask them, have you ever lost money for an investor, and if so, why? And don't be afraid to ask these questions. You're going into a partnership with these developers or these managers, and your goal is to make money, and you're they're you're entrusting them with your money. So don't be afraid to ask a basic question that you feel might be kind of elementary. Just do your due diligence. Yeah. And another good thing about asking questions, especially through email, is then you have a paper trail. So then if they tell you something and it turns out to be incorrect, you can always go back and say, like, look, this is how you explain it to me in, in plain English. So mm-hmm. that usually holds up. Uh, but the thing is, so I actually used to uh, – actually, I, I guess before I say that, one – yeah, a big thing that, that Omar had, had mentioned is – and that you had just mentioned is it's hard because there hasn't been a downturn in so long in literally a decade that it seems like everything works and everything's fine. Mm-hmm. And we're looking at all investments over, you know, through like rose, rose colored glasses where mm-hmm. if someone's been in business for nine years or 10 years and all their deals are great, I mean, it's mm-hmm. how do we know they're actually great or they're just taking big risks? And I think this is the biggest part the the biggest kind of upside and downside of investing in real estate is real estate investments are almost always leveraged versus you would almost never leverage like a investing in like an index fund or something. Like if I'm going to put a hundred grand in Vanguard, I'm going to put a hundred grand in Vanguard. I'm not going to put a hundred grand and buy, you know, seven times or eight times leverage, even though I can Mm -hmm. make a lot more money. It would just be insane. It'd be, it'd be like, nobody does that. It's a, it's, you know, it's Mm -hmm. like gambling. Yet it's mm-hmm. so normal to do with real estate, and when you think about it that way, I mean, like, what's the difference between having you know twenty percent down and like eighty percent you know uh, equity, and I guess hoping that if the deal fails, it won't drop more than twenty percent and you'll be okay, versus mm-hmm. doing that with with index funds, you know, having twenty percent in and leveraging eighty percent, hoping it doesn't drop more than twenty percent. I mean, wouldn't that be almost the same thing? And wouldn't you make a lot more money that way? Yeah. So in a lot of cases, actually, property in a down market can be more risky because they're more levered and they have, you know, they have de- debt to finance. And if uh, and if if occupancy goes down, I mean, there can be some serious problems there that you can't control as an investor. You know, yeah. if you're in one of these funds, you can't control it. If you own it outright, you can control it. So I, I think that's also why it's really important to try to find companies or funds. Uh, we've had MLG Capital on previously. They've been around for 30 years. And so they've weathered two or three significant downturns and look at their performance through those downturns is really important. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. So one, the other thing that I was going to mention is I really like these online real estate funds because I assumed that there's so many eyeballs on it that somebody would call it out if it was a, not a good deal. But as mm-hmm. Omar had mentioned, like you know, out of 50 investors, maybe none of them are reading the PPMs. So by right. me assuming that somebody else had done the, done the homework, maybe nobody had did it because maybe they're assuming that I did it. Yeah, you kind of have two layers of risk in those online platforms, right? Like we just saw Realty Shares, they went under. Um, and then I, I don't know if anyone got burned on that from Realty Shares going under or from any of the, the remaining deals on there. We'll have to try to find do some digging and get an update on there. But you kind of have you have multiple layers of risk. You have the actual aggregator and platform, and then you have the actual sponsors underneath, and then potentially even additional people that are uh, that are providing financing underneath that. So uh, it's it's complicated. But I do think that the best thing to do is is get with people that have done it a lot, get their opinions on it, make sure you get a, a review of the PPM materials, hopefully from an accountant or attorney. Look at the sponsor's history. And come up with a base of, say, five or six questions that before you go into a private deal like this, you're always going to ask the sponsor uh, or the fund manager just as routine and make sure you're happy with the answers they provide. Yeah, that, that's definitely solid advice. I, I wonder how many people are actually going to do that because <laughs> <Not> like, <me. laughs> yeah, I know it's, it sounds terrible, but I think that's the reality is, you know, people. And here's the thing is there's really – we can try we can we can do best practices we can try to vet everything but at the end of the day like we are not in that much, that much control once we give our money to someone else like they are really in control and in general most people they they're incentivized to make money so everybody's happy cuz then you'll tell more friends you invest back again 
everybody's happy. The biggest risk is when there's the next downturn, people might be over leveraged, people might be too, you know, gun happy. And that's when people get screwed. It's not when things are going well. And that is the one thing that scares me the most with real estate. Yet the tax advantages are so good. The potential growth is so Mm -hmm. good that I am actively, and I've been talking about this for 125 episodes, Sam, Please find someone who can that that, that can do this. Like I, I think I've said this so many times. I'm surprised no one's ever found, like found this. This has to exist, and if it doesn't, somebody needs to make it. But basically, I want a online real estate fund like Fundrise or any of these companies. But instead of giving our money back in five or seven years, you know, I want them to cash out, refinance in one or two years, and get back ninety percent of our money, or you know. 80 plus percent of our money right away, basically within those one or two years, but we keep the property. And that way we keep the cash flow. We keep the actual property that's getting paid down by the tenants. So we're building equity and we get back 80% of our money or 90, maybe even 100%. Some, sometimes we're using kind of like that buy, rehab, refinance, uh, renovate model. And then that allows us to basically get into another deal straight away, you know, after one or two years. And basically, that's the most, the clearest way I can see of building real wealth. Because the problem with putting, let's say we put 100 grand into, let's say we have 100 grand invest, we put 100 grand into something, we can't invest in anything until we get that money back. And even though we're getting paid 6% or 7% per month, that's not really enough to, to deploy again. But if we can get back most or all of it after one or two years with the refinance, we can basically just keep stacking deals and we can grow our portfolio, you know, with another, like another property every single one or yeah. two years. I think that's the, uh, the challenge of finding someone to be able to do that passively for you while you drink wine in Georgia. And I'm not talking Atlanta, Georgia yeah, versus but, being boots on the ground and, and doing it yourself. Cause of yeah. course there's, there's people that are doing this, but it's, it's a very active approach. But if anyone has uh, any leads on funds that are actively taking this approach that can deliver Johnny his golden goose, do give us a shout. I know it exists, guys. Let us know in the boss lounge. Some, somebody has to know of this. And if they don't know of this, somebody should create this. I think this would be like a great way, like like something that people would invest in because it's like this is how you go from one property to having 20 in 20 years. Yeah. So big shout out to Omar for coming back on. We love our second time guest. It's a rare bird, but in Omar's case, we had to make an exception. He's just got too much good material. Make sure you check out his company uh, and also some of his content. We'll leave links in the show notes. He puts out some really good stuff that just helps you wrap your head around difficult to understand concepts, especially around real estate investing, but he breaks it down and makes it real easy. So thank you, Omar. Um, Also, I'm invested in one of his deals through Boardwalk Wealth. That's been fantastic so far. So let's keep up those good returns, buddy. And other than that, Johnny, congrats know. on arriving to Georgia. <laughs> I uh, I hope I hope to to hear more about it. Stay safe and explore that wild country of Georgia. Well, you know what? If you ever want to drive up from Tampa to Georgia, I'm a state away. <laughs> yeah, man. Nice <laughs> wines up there as well, north of Atlanta. Uh, all right. Good seeing you, buddy. And thanks to everyone again. And thanks to all of you who have left the review. If you guys haven't already, please go on iTunes. Leave us a five-star review if you like the show. Tell some friends about the show. And we'll see you all in the Boss Lounge. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Best Like a Boss podcast. Join our mailing list at investlikeaboss.com to get exclusive access to our insider investment portfolios and our private members forum. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. Tell your friends and leave us a review in the iTunes store. It helps more than you know. See you guys next week.